Uh, shalom all, this is your brother Martin, and I'm coming with the second part of the Isaiah 61 through 64 study, The Return of the Messiah, which I completely underestimated how overwhelming making this video was going to be, uh, but the Risha is giving me the strength to continue. Okay, so if you were in our last episode, um, we're doing this video, but I had to cut it into two parts because I realized I was going to be over the time limit for maximum video length on YouTube. Um, all right, real briefly, again, um, it's not about me. My job is to put the information out there. It's an important topic, and we're going to jump into it in Isaiah 63, the time of great deception. So I left you with a cliffhanger where I read the first sentence of who's coming from Edom, Edom being Rome, um, it's Yeshua. Uh, it's the same day of vengeance as in chapter 34 of Isaiah. It's a twofold coming. So this day of vengeance, well, yeah, that's the great day, isn't it? Um, so this is in the future. We're talking about his return in the future, the, 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 the great day, the day of vengeance. Um, why is there red on your garment and your garments are like one who treads in the wine press? Uh, I have trodden the wine press alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. And I trod them down in my displeasure, and I trampled them in my wrath. Their blood is sprinkled upon my gardens, and I have defiled all of my raiment. Why red? Because he just crushed the grapes. Right? We talked about the grape harvest. Right? If you looked at the last video, and uh, you saw the order of the harvest, you know when the grape harvest is going to be. Well, this is after the grape harvest. So what comes right after the grape harvest? He does. He meets out justice under the law of mercy. So the reason we are all here is because of the law of justice and the law of mercy. Um, it's basically an argument between the creator of the universe, Yahuwah, and his former servant, Gadriel, um, about righteousness and the law of justice. Um, and this place that we live in is used to settle that. In any case, um, there are people who now serve Yeshua, and um, he's using the king of Assyria, which is a figure, a person, to do this crushing of the grapes um, with him, okay? And Isaiah, recall, although Daniel and John are given visions about what this looks like from the standpoint of being fast-forwarded to that point in time and seeing the 3D movie for themselves, it is only Isaiah who's actually being told what's going to happen and how it happens and why it happens. And that's what he's discussing in these books. So the king of Assyria is used for this. So this, and you know, we talked about chiasms, that there's a twofold event. One is a blessing to those who are righteous, and it's judgment for those who are wicked. It's twofold. And we talked about in the last video on Isaiah 61 and 62 how the proxies um, have a position Right? So what the proxies do is on behalf of whoever they're proxies for. Uh, Yahushua is a proxy for the remnant and the righteous, just like the king of Assyria is a proxy for the wicked. And so this chapter talks about what happens between Yahushua and the king of Assyria, who's a real person, and I'm going to show you who it is in just a minute, and don't talk to me about an antichrist or any deception like that, okay? This is how it happens. And you're going to be shocked when I show you. Because <laughs> I bet you didn't see it coming. Or maybe you did. If you've been watching my videos, you probably saw it coming. But if you're coming here new, you probably didn't see it coming. Again, not about me. I'm just revealing information. Okay, king of Assyria figure is the proxy for the wicked ones. Embodies them, acts on their behalf. But Yahushua uses what that does to achieve Yahuwah's ends. Okay? All right. Let's go to verse 4. 
For a day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. Right? This is the final judgment. And I looked, but there was none helping, and I was astonished that there was none upholding, so my own arm saved for me, and my wrath upheld me. Okay, so let's look at four and five. Charity, kindness, is lost. Right? The covenant is broken fundamentally in a Sodom society. That's where we are. Sodom society. Murdering babies, human trafficking, um, the occult, Molech worship, as in the days of Noah. Okay? The way Yahuwah intervenes in that situation is through a servant like Noah or Moses or Yahushua or the remnant. Okay? That's the way Yahuwah does it. He says it to Isaiah. I intervene with a servant, my arm. That's what he means when he talks about his own arm. His arm is the servant. In this case, it's Yahushua. And he's contrasted against the king of Assyria. Okay? And this is the chiasm we talked about, the twofold judgment. One is a blessing, one is a judgment. That's the significance of the eclipse. It's the fact that the sealing is completed, so now it is either the time of blessing or the time of curse, depending on which side you land on, with the lukewarm ones stuck in the middle. So time's not done, judgment's not set, but it's starting. Okay. When the servant intervenes for Yahuwah, that enables those who repent to be saved. This is why belief in Yahushua is fundamental. If you do what he says and you're kind to others, you meet the condition of blessing that enables you to be saved. And, the, and right, even the Christians will tell you, belief in him is what allows you to be saved. I'm not saying anything different. I'm just pointing out the specifics in Isaiah that Yahuwah told Isaiah to write down that we know have not been changed, unlike the rest of Scripture. Okay, verse 6. And I trod down peoples in my displeasure and made them drunk in my wrath and brought down their strength to earth. Right? So he does this by the king of Assyria. It's not he who is bringing down their strength. It's the king of Assyria, brings judgment to Babylon. But the king of Assyria represents the wicked. He has the spirit of Amalek. He gives fiery, angry speeches. All right? There are those who acted on the spirit of Amalek in the past. Um, and there may be, uh, so anyway, I won't get into that. Seven, let me recount the kindnesses of Yahuwah and praises of Yahuwah according to all that Yahuwah has done for us and the great goodness towards the house of Israel, which he has done for them according to his compassion and according to his many kindnesses, even though they broke the covenant, right? It says, individually, we did a little and he lifted us up, right? There are those who email me in the comments. Jesus did all the work. Okay, fine. Call him by the right name. Yehushua. Yes, Yehushua did do all the work. I agree. We did a little. He did a lot. Eight to nine. And he said, These are my people, children who do not act falsely. And he became their savior. In all their distress, he was distressed. And the messenger of his presence saved them. In his love and in his compassion, he redeemed them and he lifted them up and carried them all in the days of old, uh, all the days of, of old, right? He took their troubled sins upon himself. Where it says that he redeemed them, it's a word link using the same Hebrew word back to chapter 19 of Isaiah. So anybody who wants to st study that can go do that. But it talks about covenant love and that it's a personal redemption, right? Not a collective redemption, personal redemption. You have to meet the test yourself. And faith is not the test. That's the doctrine of Christian liberty, lulling you to sleep. All right? Faith is the start of the test. Without it, you're not going to get very far. 
but faith will only make you lukewarm. The rest of the test is described in the book of Isaiah. All right. But they rebelled and grieved his set-apart spirit, so he turned against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. All right? They rebelled, but Yahuwah will strive. If they keep rebelling, he is grieved. That's what all the books talk about. It's his grief over the fact that they keep rebelling. And if they keep rebelling, then they become subject to the king of Assyria and the curses. Right? As long as he you're you're as long as you're his, the king of Assyria has no power over you. But if you keep rebelling, you start to nullify the covenant, and then you become subject to the king of Assyria. Okay? 11 through 13. Then he remembered the days of old, Moshe, his people, where he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock, where is he who put his set-apart spirit within him, who led them by the right hand of Moshe and his comely arm, servant, dividing the water before them, right, splitting the sea, to make for himself an everlasting name. Who led them through the deep? Like a horse in the wilderness, they did not stumble. As a beast... Oh, uh, we'll, we'll stop with there. Did not stumble. All right. So if you keep rebelling, then you are subject to the king of Assyria, which is curses, covenant curses. Bondage is a covenant curse. Are you working enslaved by debt? Guess what? Debt is bondage. It's a covenant curse. But there are those slaving in bondage that are beginning to remember Yahuwah. When they seek him, when they seek him, bold that, Yahuwah will remember them. Moses implies a type. Exodus, the servant, Yahushua, in this case, leads the Exodus. Who's in the Exodus? Those that are sealed. Who comes later out of tribulation? The lukewarm, if they repent, right? when they seek him. Not the doctrine of Christian liberty. I know, hard to hear. 14 through 15. As a beast goes down into the valley and the spirit of Yahuwah causes him to rest, so you led your people to make yourself a comely name. Look down from the heavens and see from your set apart and comely dwelling. Where are your ardor and your might, the stirring of your inward parts and your compassion towards me? Are they withheld? His people remember and want it again. They remember what it's like to live with the blessings of Yahuwah, and now they're under covenant curses, working to pay off debts. And they don't want to be in bondage anymore. And so they say, why aren't you merciful? Look how weak we are down here. You're looking at us from your, look down from the heavens, from your set apart and comely dwelling. Come save us. It isn't fair. Yes, it is. Why? Because you kept rebelling, right? To the lukewarm. Do you go to church on Sundays? Do you worship idols? Do you have a Christmas tree, which is a symbol of worship to Ashtaroth? Do you go to Easter service, which is worship of the pagan goddess Ishtar? Maybe they didn't tell you this, but the whole reason religions exist is to make you break the covenant. Sorry if I'm yelling. But he's taunting you here. You as a Christian are going to say, wait, wait, I've cast out in your name. And Yahushua was going to say, get away from me, you worker of lawlessness. You have no relationship to me. You don't even know my name. And you're going to say, it's not fair. And he's going to say, yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's the law of justice. But there's also a law of mercy. And so... I'll save you out of it. It shows self-deception and a lack of honesty. All right, so there are those that are ignorant. They haven't seen any of these videos. They don't know any of this. They're just stuck in church. He'll deal with them. But for all of you watching this video, you're here for a reason. All right, once you know this, Are you just going to pretend like you don't know it?
For you are our father, through though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not recognize us, you, Yahuwah, are our father, our redeemer, your name is from old. These people aren't the Jews. They're not the political state of Israel. They don't recognize these people, the lost sheep. Yet he is their father. And they need to re renew the relationship. Yahuwah doesn't make you do it. Nobody makes you do it. You're worshiping idols. Mainly because you didn't bother to read the scripture and you trusted somebody else to interpret it for you. And they were taught by a bunch of liars. So you're self-deceived. They don't want, you don't, you know, it's a personal thing. I don't need to repent. Other people have done it for me. Yeah, kind of. But you see how subtle the deception is? All right. Uh, I didn't read that part. Oh, Yahuwah, why do you make us stray from your ways? He doesn't make you stray. The world makes you stray. This is a system set up by Godriel to take you into the pit with him and harden our hearts from your fear. Turn back for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your inheritance. He doesn't make you do it. He doesn't make you go to church on Sunday. He doesn't teach you the wrong calendar to begin with. For a little while, your set-apart people possessed it. Our adversaries have trodden down your set-apart place. Isn't that the truth? We have become like those over whom you never ruled. Your name is not called on them. Right? They changed it 6,000 times in the Bible so you wouldn't know the name. How did we get here, is what this says. <laughs> At once, we were your set-apart people, and now you won't even answer us. It's because they kept rebelling. They hardened their hearts. But, you know, he can see that they're progressing. The ones that survive, they've survived, but they're not under his protection. Right? They have self-deception. They're not honest with themselves. But one thing is clear from this scripture. His name is important. You seek him and you call him by his name. And when people ask me in a comment, I get it, what should I do? I say, go and get the free Kindle book from uh, Alan Horvath. It talks exactly about what you need to do to establish that personal relationship. And the first thing is, you seek him by his name. You learn his name. And you start praying to his name. His name is important. Yahuwah and Yahushua. Okay, moving on. How did everybody get so deceived? I mean, if I talk about the scale of the lies, and I have for at least five years, if not ten years, nobody believes me. They're like, oh, there's no lie that can be that big. Guess what? The father of lies can make a lie that big. And this goes back to declaring the end from the beginning. So if you go back to Jeremiah, it'll say, In the dis day of distress of the Gentiles shall come all those who say, Our fathers have inherited only falsehood. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So guess what's encoded in Jeremiah 16, right? Is this back in the days of the Jews, right? No. Here's a table where it says, Our Father's Inherited Line, in the plain text of the Bible, same terms. All of the people in our time, in the time of COVID, with the Nazarim, the remnant of the House of Israel, in the USA, in the era of distress, right? He's talking to these people. When, he's, when Jeremiah says in chapter 16, here, in the future, in the day of distress, at the end of days, in the USA, the Gentiles, nations, shall come from the ends of the earth and say, our fathers inherited lies. <laughs> How do I know? How can I proclaim it so loudly? Because it's encoded, and we have an ephod that tells us this. Again, 22 billion to one odds that this is not random chance in the book of Jeremiah. Here's what the table looks like. 
All right, you can see all these things encoded. Great, interesting relationship between some of the terms like Obama crossing traitor <laughs> and, uh, and all these other things. And I'm again, I'm going to, you know, not get into all of these terms and, and, and the interpretation of this table. It's kind of plain, the picture that it paints. I'm going to zoom into the center, though, because there's a very important thing in here, right? Um, there's for the USA connecting to the access term, which, again, is in the plain text of the Bible that says, our fathers inherited lies. He's saying that to the USA in this time when all these people are among us, and he's talking to the Nazarene. He's talking to one of the... the, the this verse, no, sorry, these books in Jeremiah speak to a specific person. And I know you're not going to like this. Um, let's zoom in on the table first, and we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, if I zoom in, and so you can really see the Hebrew here, our father's inherited lies is this Hebrew phrase here. And then here is for the USA, connecting to it with the Aleph in the middle of this term, our father's inherited lies. What was the lie? Right underneath it, my name, says Yahuwah. That's the lie they've inherited. They have not known his name. I also, you know, some relationships. Who connects tribulation to the USA? Well, it's Hillary. Um, there's war. There's deception. There's a coming invasion. There's all kinds of stuff going on here. That's all going to get very, very clear as I work through this. Oh, yeah. All right, which leads us to declaring the end from the beginning. He knew this was going to happen. Jeremiah wrote it down. He's talking to us in the end of days, talking about the lies we've inherited and the fact that we're all, you know, the lukewarm are going to get spit out if they don't wake up soon, now, because the ceiling is finishing with this eclipse the day after tomorrow as I publish this. So this is who the book in Jeremiah is talking to. If you look... In Jeremiah, um, he's talking, so actually, sorry, declaring the end from the beginning in the book of Isaiah, the end from the beginning where it's declared by Isaiah that Yahuwah declares the end from the beginning. This entire two books are Yahuwah speaking to his servant, the anointed Cyrus, through Isaiah, because at the very first verse in Isaiah 45, it says, to my anointed Cyrus, and he goes through all of this to book 46, verse 10, where he declares the end from the beginning. So he's explaining all of this to Cyrus through Isaiah, who's the prophet at the time of Cyrus. And of course, just like the ancient fulfillment, there's a modern fulfillment. Who is Cyrus now? Just like there's a king of Assyria now, there's a Cyrus now. Who's Cyrus? Well, <laughs> if you've been watching any kind of Hebrew roots or prophecy videos or whatever, you probably know who Cyrus is. And I know you're not going to like it. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, even the Jews figured this out. They started minting coins on the fact that the modern day Cyrus is DJT, right? And which is why he appears in the tables, which is why he was put in as the Moloch at the time to accomplish certain things by the will of Yahuwah. I'm not saying that he's righteous. What I'm saying is he was used by the will of Yahuwah, right? To by anointed Cyrus <laughs> is in the plain text in Isaiah chapter 45. And it goes all the way down to chapter 46, declaring the end from the beginning. What is the end? It's this time, right? With the Nazarene. When I found this table in Gregorian calendar year 2020, in September and published it on the Code Searcher channel in the USA, in the tribulation, with all of these political figures that are well known appearing in the table, right? 
Isaiah written in the scroll that was found that we know has not been altered, speaking to Cyrus in his time and Cyrus in our time about declaring the end from the beginning, <clears throat> which is in the books from chapter 55 through 66, which are the subject of these videos, right? So I'm saying declaring end from the beginning is very important in Isaiah because it's in Isaiah, which we know hasn't been changed. And it's using the figures in our day to describe how this plays out because it's set just like the end of a movie. We know how it ends. By the way, the evil ones know how it ends too. I'm going to prove that to you. Let's talk about Isaiah 64 now. The judgment of the wicked. What happens when Yahushua returns? He judges the wicked. All right. Oh, that you would tear the heavens open, come down, that mountains shall shake before you. As when fire burns twigs, a fire makes water boil, your name, uh, to make your name known to your adversaries so that nations tremble before you, when you did awesome matters which we did not expect, you came down, mountain did, mountains did shake before you. Quaking. This quaking is brought by the king of Assyria, the servant that Yahushua uses to destroy. This is the template. Isaiah writes down the template. Yahushua doesn't do the destroying of Babylon's. Babylon. The Assyrians destroy Babylon. Just like in ancient times, the Assyrians came and destroyed Babylon, and then Yahuwah destroyed the Assyrians. So he uses evil against evil to accomplish his purposes, and then his will is done. And that's how his will is accomplished. So it's the king of Assyria, actually, that brings this quaking. And... Uh, I, I, I'm only going to remind you things that I've already published in videos, but this, again, ties all the things for the last four or five years together. The Assyrians destroy first by the king of Assyria, acting as a proxy. Then the Assyrians are destroyed. Then Yahushua comes. Okay? Verse 4. Since the beginning of the ages, when they have not heard nor perceived by ear, nor has the eye seen any Elohim besides you who acts for those who wait for him. He personifies salvation. Yeshua, Yehushua personifies salvation. The allegiance has been tested to the utmost. We're at the end of the tribulation. That's when he comes, right? After the grapes. And they still wait for him. The adversaries are purifying. They, the test sanctifies them, right? Because the king of Assyria is just slaughtering, right? The, the, the wine press, the river of blood. That is... That is the, the final test, right, for those that still haven't repented. If they go through that and they're, they're, they call on his name, he will still save them. But who are we talking about? Well, it's that same whiny group that says, oh, you know, come save us. It's not fair. Yeah, it's fair. Um, this is what he's talking about in, in verse 5. <clears throat> you shall meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. See, you were wroth when we sinned in them a long time. And should we be saved? Should you? Right? There's self-deception, but they're starting to wake up and follow his ways. They're not destroyed, but they're struggling. They're coming around, but they recognize they're suffering because they're being cursed. Right? They, they haven't come out of it. They continue to suffer the curses of rebelling against the covenant. Right? A person can be forgiven. It doesn't mean that there are no consequences. This is what the law of justice and the law of justice means of mercy mean you will be saved that doesn't mean you pay no consequences right you can still be saved at the last hour but you will have endured a whole bunch of consequences before that happens it's really how badly you are deceived some of you might be waking up right now listening to my voice some of you might be listening to this thing oh, that's all bullshit it's not up to me right? You may have ears to hear. You may disagree with me. You may think I'm out of my mind. Again, I'm just delivering the information. Verse 6, and all of us have become as one unclean, and all our righteousness are as soiled rags, and all of us fade like a leaf, and our crookedness like the wind has taken us away. There's more to it than just accepting Yahushua. 
You need to be sanctified to not perish in Yahuwah's presence. Get that? You can't be assoiled. Even me, I'm... So I don't even know how I'm going to pass this test. When they do it individually on a large scale, then Yahuwah can come and be in a group presence, a mass scale, right? But we're not there. We're, we're in a time of, like, the days of Noah, right? Basically, in order for the vast majority of people to be individually sanctified, a whole bunch of unrighteous are going to have to perish. And that's brought by the king of Assyria. And I'm going to tell you how it happens. And I know, and I told you there were females in this, in this, this group that's redeemed, and many of them get visions, and many of them have actually seen what happens. All right, this group recognizes they have sinned, they have broken the covenant, they have been deceived, they recognize that they deceive themselves, and they start to seek Yahuwah through Yahushua. And the only way to Yahuwah is through Yahushua. And if you get Alan, Alan's ebook for free, that's the first thing he says. All right, <clears throat> moving on, wrapping this up. And all of us have become unclean. So that, that's a, a continuation. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our crookedness. Right? This group does not call on his name. You lukewarm, you call on Godriel's name. And you call on... The J word, which was invented 500 years ago to deceive you. Now they see the difference between themselves and the elect. They recognize they're lukewarm. They didn't know any of this. The elect call on his name continually. Yes, we do. It takes more than token allegiance. You must think on the things of Yahuwah. Otherwise, you won't be able to endure his presence. You will burn the elect are able to endure his presence anytime. Iniquity is different than sin. Iniquity is lasting. Sin is temporary. Sin can be forgiven, but iniquity is enduring. You have to repent of the iniquity, and then your sin can be forgiven. The power that the king of Assyria has over them tires them. Okay, let's talk about eight. And now, O Yahuwah, you are our father, we are the clay, you are our potter, and we are all the work of your hand. They realize they're lukewarm and they're about to be destroyed. And so they're appealing because now they know his name. Do not be wroth, O Yahuwah, nor remember crookedness forever. Right? It's just sin, not iniquity. We, we're really good. Please look at us. All of us are your people. Right? These same whiny ones that are enduring the king of Assyria and all the tribulation he's bringing, right? They're part of the ten tribes. They recognize they need to overcome their iniquities. They did not repent when it was time. That time comes to a close two days from now with the eclipse. It doesn't mean there still isn't time. They still can. It's just tribulation starts. And it's going to get ugly fast. Even though they didn't repent when it was time, they still can. They want the same blessing that the ones who are redeemed are getting. But now they have to endure. Because the iniquity is what has to get cleansed from them so that they can be saved. <clears throat> Your set-apart cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem a waste. They recognize this covenant people. You who are slow to listen because they were slow to repent. Now they are making great progress. But these places become wastes. And those occupying them now who are unrighteous get burned up before this starts. Our set-apart and comely house where our fathers praised you has been burned up with fire because it was occupied by the unrighteous. And all that we treasured has become a ruin. Money lenders in the temple, all of that, the world, this fourth beast. In view of all this, would you restrain yourself, O Yahuwah? Would you keep silent and afflict us beyond measure? He's not afflicting you beyond measure. The king of Assyria afflicts you, 
because you're subject to him because of the rebellion and the iniquity. The spiritual has to precede the physical. It has to precede the physical. You undo your iniquity by recognizing you need to seek Yahuwah. Self-control is one of the fruits of the Rusha. All right, so I've been talking about Yahushua and the king of Assyria. Who is this king of Assyria? This is what it looks like in the Hebrew when we're, when we're talking about it in um, Isaiah 64 and 63. It's the king of Assyria, the Malek Ashur. Well, it turns out, if you've been watching my videos in the past, that I talk about this figure about the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And this king of Assyria, turns out, it's the same guy <laughs> in our time. Plot twist. Who would have thought it? And this guy, you're going to recognize. Because right now, if you live in the USA, we've been at war with him for two years already. Two years. Thinking we're righteous when really... We're just giving power to the king of Assyria to come destroy Babylon. What is this war we've been fighting two years? Well, if you look at Tubal, it says it's the land to the west of the Moshi, which is the Moshean Mountains here in the Baltics. What's to the west of there? Oh, it's right here. Yeah, and all those in control that want to spend money on this war with the king of Assyria to give the king of Assyria power, guess what? They don't really have your best interests at heart. <laughs> How do we know? Well, it's not because I was smart or anything. It's actually because another code searcher, Chris Ray, published the table on this more than 10 years ago. On this very event, the start of the global battle, starting in Kiev, involving the Prince of Rosh and Meshach, right here, this term, Nishia Rosh Meshach, right here, connecting to the global battle. In Ezekiel 38, which is the last global war prophesied in Ezekiel 38, which is why Chris was motivated to find this table and how it started, so that he, as a watchman set among us, could warn us, which he did 10 years prior to its starting, and again, immediately upon its starting, published this table again, and I'm going to explain it here. Thank you, Chris. For your obedience. So as you finally figured out, if I've beat around the bush too long, the king of Assyria is Vladimir Putin, and he's also the prince of Rosh and Meshach. And we, you know, it's encoded all through different chapters of Ezekiel and Isaiah. In the end of days, Vladimir Putin is the king of Assyria, and he's also the prince of Rosh and Meshach. And I can show you endless code tables that he's the king of Syria and the prince of Rosh and Meshach during the tribulation. And here, in the end of days. And here. And here. And here. Get it? <laughs> so what is Chris's table? It's the last global war predicted in Ezekiel 38, thousands of years ago. Chris published this table in 2013. It involves Russia. Starts in Kiev, which is where it started. The third war involving the Prince of Rosh and Meshach and his adversary, the bummer. I won't get into the rest of these terms. You can go search for that video on YouTube if it's still there. I'm kind of doubting it's still there. Uh, I believe, though, I cover this in A Warning to the Remnant. If you're interested in that, there's a video on my channel. I'll link it uh, here, for convenience, in case you want to take a look at that later. 
Uh, how does the king of Assyria bring judgment to Babylon? Well, I've been talking about it the last few videos. It's a tsunami. It's a tsunami that hits the USA. In fact, it's not just one tsunami. It's actually a pair of tsunamis that hit each coast. And if we zoom in on that table, you'll see there's two tsunamis here. And they come from the quake. What is that quake? Well, I showed you a table from Scott Bunnell that talked about this and, in fact, showed how it was carved into stone in the column capitals of temples in New York. Because the end also know what's going to happen. And I'm going to prove that to you, too, before this video is over, even though these are long videos. Uh, this is in the States. The quake is in the States that causes these tsunamis. Well, actually, what happens is there's a quake. There are quakes not in the states that cause the tsunamis and then when the tsunamis hit the states it causes the tsunami, it causes the quake in the states how do i know this my sisters have the visions my brothers have the visions they've seen it just like jeremiah saw it just like isaiah saw it just like daniel saw it and just like john saw it they've seen it i haven't been given that vision i've been given a couple visions but not that vision what is it it's the manifestation of the law of justice under the covenant. The judging of the wicked. Happens in the USA during our time, the time of tribulation, right? The names are encoded. COVID, right? Name. I found the table in 2020. Lots of interesting stuff. This table... There's another table talking about the tsunami in the end of days encoded in the books of Leviticus 12 through 14. What are those books? Well, what happens in the end of days? There's two metaphors for it. There's a wedding. Well, there's three, right? There's, there's the wedding, there's the harvest, and then there's a woman giving birth, right? The Revelation 12 sign, woman giving birth. Well, Leviticus 12, isn't that an interesting parallelism, is the Torah of woman giving birth, what you do when women give birth. Leviticus 13 is the Torah of corruption of the flesh, spe specifically leprosy in this case. And Leviticus 14 is the Torah of the cleansing of corruption, which is by fire. This whole code is encoded in those books, the tsunamis that hit the USA in the end of days with, again, all of the time markers of COVID and Nasara and political names, just to make sure we're talking about the right time. Several years encoded. Talked about the significance of 5782 starting the ceiling. And I don't set dates, but the last date in this table, which is significant because it's an abacus effect in the plain text, <clears throat> right? Uh, there's two dates that are in the plain text, 5781, which is when the table was found, and 5785. So I wouldn't be surprised at the timing of this, but I don't do predictions. But Tsunami and USA have the same skip, just in opposite directions. That's a very statistically significant. Again, the odds of this table are crazy. Like, I don't know how many quadrillion, quintillion, septillion this is, but it's staggering. It's definitely not by random chance in these books of Leviticus, which is not just the Tanakh, but the Torah, which gives it even more weight. Okay, um, and that is the timing here that we're talking about here in the end of days with these Shemitahs, right? Because judgment and release and those things, sorts of things are all about Shemitahs. And there's a Shemitah year in there with 5781. Oh, by the way, um, right? That's a Shemitah year encoded in this table, that this table was found in a Shemitah year. And uh, that just happens to be sort of halfway through. So what's this table? All right, well, so it talks about the tsunami in the USA, the coming of Wormwood, and that the USA will be flooded and there will be earthquakes. And the Shemitah goes right through here, right? So it was found in a Shemitah year. In the era of distress, right? So... Again, a lot of significance here. Found in the Shemitah year, September of the Shemitah year. I wouldn't be surprised if it was found 
very close proximity to one of the feasts because that's when the feasts happen. La Palma is the source of one of these tsunamis. Okay, uh, I've covered it in the past. The table from Scott Bunnell had La Palma in it. That's why I talked about it a few videos. This table here probably, oh no, this is the second highest odds. So there was one table higher than this that's in my past couple of videos um, for statistical significance. This is the second highest, 121 quadrillion to one that this is not random chance. La Palma being encoded twice with a tsunami hitting the USA in the time of the end of days as part of the covenant. Um, let's look at the table. All right, La Palma is the access term. USA crossing it, eclipse as the sign. Um, right, La Palma again. Uh, volcano. La Palma is a volcano. And in Scott Bundle's table, there is the term the submarine which is how the volcano on La Palma is set off and causes the tsunami that hits the east coast of the United States. Well, there's another island that gets hit to cause a volcano to go off and causes the tsunami for the west coast. All right, as if we need a further confirmation, there's another table in the book of Jeremiah 30, about the tsunamis, the two tsunamis hitting the United States. Uh, again, found in the Shemitah year 5781, which represents Gregorian 2021. This is the Shemitah year was when this table was found. In the end, uh, predicting this uh, tsunamis associated with La Palma in the end of days. Um, 5784 being this year when I'm publishing this for you all to find out about it. Uh, the tsunami in the States. Uh, I believe both of these tsunamis are encoded together. In any case, we have the years encoded. Um, U.S. In the, in the States is horizontal, right? USA is horizontal encoded with the tsunamis. Uh, so again, but what is Jeremiah 30? Why would it be encoded in Jeremiah 30? Okay. Jeremiah 30, it says, uh, For this is what Yahuwah said, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not peace. Ask now and see if a man is giving birth. A man giving birth? Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor and all faces turned pale? Why? Because you're looking at a thousand foot tall wall of water. That's why. For it is that great day, there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress, but he shall be saved out of it. And it shall be on that day, declares Yehu of hosts, that I break his yoke from your neck and tear off your bonds, and foreigners no more enslave my people, right, them, the, the, the remnant. What day? This day. This day. When you see this, that's the day. It's not the day of uh, his return, but that's the day that the, the yoke is broken off. Okay. And in the next uh, book, Isaiah 31, it says, For I shall be a father to Israel and Ephraim. He is my firstborn. And Ephraim represents... The lost sheep of the house of Israel that had been grafted into the nations, the ones that Yeshua said he came for in the Gospels, when he said, I come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yahuwah repeats it. That is where this Bible code about the tsunamis hitting the Babylon in the end of days, the USA, to finalize his judgment occurs. And one more witness is the table found by my brother Doug. Access term La Palma as the judgment on Babylon in Jeremiah 50. Okay.
where it's encoded, right here. Because of the wrath of Yahuwah, it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. Everyone that goes by Babylon shall be astonished. Right? 2,000 foot tall walls of water, which then split the country like a zipper down the path of the eclipse and set off all the volcanoes. Wholly desolate. That's what the judgment of the wicked looks like. And they know. They know it's coming. You want to know why? Well, because last year there was a movie put on Netflix. And this is it. You can look up one of its executive producers. His name is encoded in all these tables. So he knows it's coming. How does that end? Well, it ends when this guy running from something because his face is full of astonishment and fear runs into a house and closes the door behind him. Because what's coming is a tsunami that breaks through all the windows of his house as the thing fades to black. So guess what? The wicked know. The wicked know this is coming. That's why they're building all their billion-dollar bunkers. But Yahuwah says, you cannot hide in the rocks from me. He sees all things. So good luck there, wicked. You know what's coming. Because Isaiah tells you in chapter 5, because he declares the end from the beginning. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to the mighty who drink wine and brave men to mix strong drink who declare right from wrong with a bribe, and the righteous for the righteous they turn aside from him. Right? Corruption. The days of Noah. All the things going on that sit in your conscience and you know something's not right. Therefore, as fire devours stubble, Yahuwah is going to devour all of them. And that's the message to them. But that's not the message to us. Either the righteous remnant, or the lukewarm that are just waking up. For us, the message is that he, Yahushua, comes on the storm. It's a big storm. It's going to be ugly. It starts in Kiev. This is my confirmation of Chris Ray's code of the war that starts in Kiev with all the same terms Chris found. And it looks like this. He comes on the storm. If I can remember which previous video I first published this in a couple years ago, I will link it now. What is that storm? Yeah. It's that war we're in the middle of for the last two years. That's the start of it. But all the missiles and the tsunamis and all of the tribulation that the king of Assyria is going to bring because he is the arm of the servant in these days and we are and the USA is Babylon so he has been empowered because Yahuwah uses evil against evil to achieve his purposes and that's how it is because that's how he told Isaiah to write it down so for us we wait with great anticipation because Yahushua comes on the storm as the storm right Coded in this table is this relationship. Fear not the Messiah. Yahushua comes on the storm, which makes the same pattern in the code as the eclipses are making above our country an Aleph and a Tav. Almost poetic to end it there, everyone. So have great hope. For those of you who see this message as a wake-up call, I encourage you not to sit silent and be lukewarm, but to take action and seek the Father and use his name. And with that, brothers and sisters, we're going to conclude this study of the coming of the Messiah. What do I do now? If you've realized you're on the lukewarm fence, seek Yahuwah, use his name, go on Kindle and get Alan Horvath's free ebook 
it gets into the specifics of how to establish that personal relationship because it is a personal testing and how to do it the fastest way possible because time is short. With that, brothers and sisters, shalom to you all. I hope you have a great day and that this uh, message has been a great baruching and I will see you in the next video, which will be about the new earth. Shalom.